for our uh, online followers. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Again, we'll let any stragglers in from the waiting room, but I'm really excited for our second faculty lecture of this semester. We are joined by Rhodes Professor of Mathematics, Dr. Eric Gottlieb, who his this is his second lecture in this series. Um, the last lecture he gave, as he re recalled, reminded me was in 2021. So um, Dr. Gottlieb, we're really excited to have you back. And I would love for you to start by sharing a little bit about yourself and your background, and then feel free to take it from there with, with everything else you have planned for us today. Sure. So first of all, thanks for the invitation. I really, I think this is a wonderful series and uh, it's it's great that you guys are doing it. And um, uh, so myself, I came to Memphis in 1998 for a job at Rhodes. It was my first job out of grad school and I've been there ever since. And it's been a, a great ride for me. Um, I had a Fulbright in 2004, 2005 to Chile. That was really a wonderful experience. And, um, you know, I got to pinch myself every day because I really love the, uh, I love my job. I love working with my students. I have great colleagues. And so it's a really uh, rewarding job for me. And on top of it, I get to do research like the stuff I'm gonna share with you today. Um, the grading part is the only part that I don't like. Everything else is great. <laughs> so um, let's see, what else can I tell you about me? I have a couple of sons, they're grown now. Um, one of them just stepped in the front door to grab something that I left for him up front. Um, and uh, they're both here in Memphis, so we've got to I got to keep them, and that's really also uh, obviously very rewarding for me. So I'm not taking it for granted. I know that won't last forever, and trying to make the most of it day by day, uh, see them as much as I can. They're they're gonna uh, they're, we're gonna get together this weekend. It happens to be my birthday this weekend, so uh, we'll get together for that as well. Okay, so uh, let me get started here. I'm gonna uh, share my slides with you. Um, the, uh, I will preempt. So for, you're welcome to jump in anytime with questions. If, uh, if they, if something's not clear or if you're just a point of curiosity or whatever you like, please don't hesitate to jump in. Um, I will tell you there's one question that every mathematician anticipates. Uh, and I'll, I will just, uh, preempt that question by telling you, uh, that, that question being, what is this used for? Um, every, so mathematics is held to sort of a, um, a different standard than a lot of other disciplines. For example, poetry, uh, somebody writes a beautiful poem or analyzes poetry in a certain way. Um, that's not a typical question one would get. Uh, so mathematics, welcome, Andrea. Nice to have you here. Um, mathematics can be viewed in a way that's similar to poetry. Of course, sometimes it's also applicable. But history has shown us that we don't always know which mathematical subjects are going to be applicable. In fact, this summer I gave a talk in uh, in Netherlands talking exactly about that, just giving examples of cases where mathematics was developed because it was beautiful. And years, sometimes centuries, sometimes eons later, it wound up uh, being extremely important and useful, but it wasn't developed for that reason. Now, the most notable example of that is the Greek study of conic sections. Um, the Greeks had also wondered about the motion of the planets. And uh, it turns out that conic sections describe that perfectly, but that wouldn't have been known or nearly perfectly. It's there's relativistic effects, whatever. Anyhow, Newton showed that, it, that, that uh, conic sections uh, follow from the simple law of gravitation, that the, the planets move in the shape of an ellipse, for an example. Um, and uh, those conic sections were studied just because they were beautiful, you know, 2,500 years ago. Okay, so uh, let's see. Did I, I think I shared this thing? Yeah, I'm sharing. Good. Okay, so combinatorial games. Um, the combinatorial games are uh, different from, you may have heard of game theory as practiced by economists, for instance. Um, the term prisoner's dilemma or have, has anybody heard of prisoner's dilemma or, or the, that kind of game theory? Biologists also think about evolutionary game theory. That's a different kind of game theory than what, what this is. Um, so rather than give you a careful definition of exactly what a combinatorial game is, I'm, we're just gonna play some games together and that'll give you a sense. And then towards the end, I'll give you an idea about the kind of research that I'm currently doing. 
All right, so, uh, so this is the outline of the talk. First, we'll talk about a subtraction game, very simple game. Then we'll talk about chomp. Um, another famous game, NIM is an important game uh, for reasons I'll get into in a minute. And then there's also partition games. Those are the areas of my own research. That's what I'm looking at right now, are games that are played on what are called partitions. Um, excuse me just one second. I, I've got something on the stove that I need to turn off. My coffee was boiling over, so had to go rescue it. And it in turn is going to rescue me. Okay, so, um, right. These are the games we're gonna be talking about today. Let's start with the subtraction game. So the way this works is you have a pile of tokens, whatever, uh, rocks or toothpicks, it doesn't matter. And uh, there are two players and they're gonna take turns. And in their turn, they get to remove either three or five tokens. And the object of the game is to uh, take the last stone or last token. And once that token is removed, then uh, you're, you're the winner. So let's just, uh, here's an example of play that could happen on a, uh, on a pile of 15 stones. So the first player chose to remove three. The second player chose to remove three. Then the first player removed five. And now the second player only has one choice. They're forced to remove three. However, so with one stone left, no further move is possible. So the second player made the last move. So the second player would be the winner. So I'll just mention this is one way to play. The other way to play is the person to make the last move loses. That's a different kind of play. It's called misere play. The, the way I'm describing, if the last player to move wins, that's called normal play. And normal play is generally easier to analyze than the other kind, so we'll focus on normal play for now. Although I will mention uh, an example of misere play in just a few minutes. Okay, so first let me ask, guys, do you understand uh, the rules of the game? Okay, so let's, uh, let's do some analysis now. This will give you a sense of what it's like to try to figure out when you, so like, for example, in this case, the second player won, but could the first player have played differently and then eked out a win? Well, we'll see. So uh, let's take a look at uh, how we could analyze this. So typically, um, if, so if there are zero stones here, and I need to annotate now, I'm gonna mark this up with an annotation. I hope you guys don't mind. Uh, if I can get here, annotate, okay. Um, so when there's no move, then the previous player has won, right? That means um, that the, the current player doesn't have a move, so the previous player won. And that's true if there are zero, oops, um, zero or, oh, no, no. <laughs> Okay, this is going to be harder than I thought. Uh, or one or two stones. In all those cases, the previous player wins. Does that make sense? Now, if you have three stones, what's your move going to be? Uh, uh, I saw you speak, Shelly, but you're muted, so I couldn't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, just to myself, I was saying three. Because right, you, you take three, of course. Right. And if you do that, then you win. You've taken, you've made the last legal move. So here we would say that the next player wins. So if there's a pile of three stones, whoever's playing next is the one who wins. And so this P and N are used to uh, denote whether a position is winning or losing. It's a losing position if the previous player wins. It's a winning position if the next player wins. Okay. How about four? Previous or next? Previous, says Hal. 
And uh, did, did I read you? Did I read you right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's see if that's right because notice that this player can take three, right. getting one, and then the opponent has no move. So really, it's the next player that wins this one. The next player wins because they have a move. Okay. Uh, how about with five? Well, once again, they could take five stones right. and win immediately. So the next player wins. And that, so let's try to understand though what it is that's going on. I'm going to draw a picture here. Notice that from three, there was a move to a P position. From four, there was a move to a P position. From five, there was a move to a P position. That's what makes a position an end position. If you can get from that current position to a P position in one move, then the next the, that's the next player wins position. Okay. So now from six, can we get to a P position? The answer is yes, we can. If we take five, oops, a bit got too aggressive with that one. If we take five, that takes us to this P position right here. So then this is going to be an end position. And same with seven. Okay, so it starts to feel like everything's going to be an end position, but now look at eight. When we move from eight, we have two options. We can take three, or we can take five. Oops. Both of those are moves to end positions. That means the next player, your opponent, is going to win. And so if you're if your only move is to uh, a move in which your opponent wins, then uh, that means that you're, you, the next player, are not the winner, so it must have been the previous player. So um, basically what I'm saying is that if there exists a move to a P position, then it's an N position. And if not, if all the moves are to N positions, then it's a P position. So we can continue to think in this way. This one will also be P. 10 will be, we can move to 7 or 5. So that's also a P. What about 11? Can anyone see what, where, where are the legal moves from 11? Mm -hmm. 6, right? Uh, yeah, you can go uh, to 6 if you move 5. Or you can go to eight if you take three. So um, so this is an end position. Uh, because, because we can get to a P position. Very good. Okay, so now we see a bit of a pattern going on here. Look, it went P, 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 N, 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 N. Uh, sorry, P, 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 N, 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 N. P, P, P. And we can see, if you think about it a little bit, this pattern is going to repeat. Mm -hmm. And that's, you can prove that for any subtraction game, that's exactly what's what, what winds up happening, is that there's this relatively short sequence of, uh, of P's and N's that winds up repeating indefinitely. So that it'll be there and it'll be there. And in fact, so we had started in the previous game. Let's just remember the previous game. We had started with 15 tokens, right? So if we want to know, can the player win with 15 or not? Well, uh, basically what we have to do is just from 15 over here, that repeating pattern is eight long. So if we take eight away from 15, we're down here at seven. So the next player, the first player, mm -hmm. should have won that game. And in fact, we can see exactly how they should have moved. Because from 15, they can move either to 12 or 10. 10 is a P position. That means that the previous player, which is the one who just made the move, 
is the winner. So they should have taken five instead of taking three. If you remember in that previous game, they took this, they began by taking three, so they should have taken five, and then they could force a win. So um, that's this is sort of the essence of combinatorial games. You have some games, sometimes the rules are simple, like in this case, sometimes they're complicated. And you it's there's never like rolls of dice or any other elements of chance, dealing of cards or anything like that. So and it's a game of full information. So every player knows exactly what moves are available to them and what moves are available to their opponents. And uh, it turns out that with a few other minor assumptions, the um, uh, you can show that one or other of the players will, all, can, will always have a winning strategy, as long as there's no draws allowed. Okay, so here, obviously, there's no such thing as a draw because somebody's going to take that last make that last move. I feel like I've been talking a whole lot. Let me be quiet for a minute and just see if there are any questions. Yes, Hal, go ahead. So I'm sure there's, how would how would this game or this theory be applied elsewhere? Um, I assume there are applications for it. Um, no, not that I know of. Okay. Um, so, th and this particular, there's no claim that this game or any really most combinatorial games are applicable. There are some combinatorial games that are applicable, um, but the applications that I'm aware of are more focused on, um, uh, like, so there there are connections to other areas of mathematics, not so much to applied problems in the sense that that most folks would think about them. But for for me and for many practicing mathematicians. What we're really focused on is trying to uh, is trying to understand the structure of what's going on, like trying to, and, and honestly, a lot of us are motivated by just a sense of aesthetics. Like when we see something is beautiful, like if we if we study a game and we figure out a solution, particularly if there's an elegant solution to it, then uh, that is really motivating for us. And as I mentioned at the start of the talk, that has actually proved to be a pretty good. Um, means of finding applicable results, just like the conics, the Greeks found the conics, which wound up being exactly the tool needed to describe planetary motion, um, even 2000 years later, like they, no one, they, they were wondering about the motion of the planets, but they didn't, they couldn't imagine that these conic sections that they were studying were perfect ways of describing their, uh, the motion of the planets. Okay, so sorry to disappoint. I don't have applications. Sorry, right. um, just, so just curious. Again? Oh, that's fine. Uh, um, Shelly, did you have a question? No, no. Okay. Uh, I am going to clear these annotations. If I can get my computer to cooperate. Let's see. Here they are. Clear all drawings. Okay. So now we can move on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so that was the one we just did. All right, so here's Chomp. So this is a different game, also famous, and it's famous for an interesting reason, which is that we can prove that whoever moves first will win. And uh, but we will we can't figure out exactly what that winning first move is. So it's a really kind of a strange situation. And this is, did, did any of you read the book, A Beautiful Mind, or see the movie? Yeah, great book. It was a good movie. It was a great book. Really, really, really well written. And if you've seen the movie and not read the book, strongly encourage you to read the book as well. Sylvia Nassar, I think, was the author. Um, but, uh, so John Nash, the guy who's featured in that, was the one who first gave the kind of argument that I'm going to share with you it's called strategy stealing. And that's how we can know that the first player will win. So what's this game? We start with an M by N grid of squares. The one in the upper left-hand corner is poison. And a move consists of, you're gonna take one square and remove all the squares below and to the right of that square. And then the last player to move, and so in this case, you could view it as, this is like a misere game because the last player to move, the one who eats that last square, um, is the one uh, who loses instead of the one who wins. So here are some rectangles. So let's just think for a second about this game. Um, 
So here's here's the generic uh, board. I've well, I've drawn. It's not generic in the sense that it has particular. We can make it any size we like, but it's big enough that it feels generic. So let me just try to illustrate. Like, suppose on my move, I decided to eliminate this square right here. If I choose this square, then I actually am not just going to take that one, but all of these too. And Shelly, if you move next, which square would you choose? Um, four from the right at the very top row. So this one? No, to uh, go over three more. Here? Right. Yeah. Uh, here. Okay. Uh -huh. So if you, if you take this one, that okay. turns it back into right. a rectangle again because we're removing everything below and to the right of it. Hal, how about you? Where, if you move, where would you go? I'd um, go in the bottom left-hand corner. This one here? Yes, sir. Okay. And Sophie, what about you? It's your turn. Uh, I think two below the X. Two below the X. So right here? Yeah, I think so. All right. So you take all those. All right, you guys are doing a good job because now, uh, so you, uh, I'll just point out, I wanna show maybe one other kind of move as well. Let me clear these drawings real quick. Um, you know, it, with the first move here, a second move, for example, could be up here or something. It's hard to describe, but notice that now we have this kind of ragged edge to the, uh, to the thing and we can get, the edges can become quite ragged um, with play. So, um, you know, if you have a larger partition, especially, we could then remove these two or something like that and, uh, and so on. So, um, good. Well, in asking you what move you would make, I was not in any way expecting that you would be able to figure out what, whether it was a winning move or not. But let me ask you now, what if there's only one row? Like what if the, the um, if the grid only has one row, but n uh, columns. What what move would you make in that case? If the person who makes the the last move so that the box with the X is left is the winner, correct? Exactly. Uh, doesn't matter. Well, if if you want to, let's say I make this move right here. If you want to make me eat that X, what, uh, which, where would you move? I take them all. That's right. So that's the way to <laughs> move right there. If yeah. you take them all, then, uh, then I have no choice but to eat the X, and now, now you win. So in this case, this is an example of the next player to win. This is, this is an end position because whoever's turn it is can force a win by taking everything except for that poison square. All right, so what if it's two by N? Not so easy. Not as easy. Sophie, do you see? I was thinking the one that's diagonally down from the X. Like here? Yeah. If we take this one, okay. Um, well, let me, uh, I think that's not a winning yeah. move, but um, but let's see why. So we have to, I have to offer a, a response that will let me win, right? So what if I go here? Oops, not there. Oh. What if I go here? Now it's your turn. So you can only get one of these squares, right? Mm -hmm. And whichever one you get, I'll take the next one in my turn, and then that leaves you with with the with the poison. So that we we that that one um, is a good chomp move, but it's not a winning chomp move. Mm. So what would be, can anyone, let's, let's uh, notice. So this move here, 
like this position um, is one in which whoever's turn it is to move is the loser. So this is a P position, right? Because if it's my turn and I take this one, then it's your turn and you take this one, and now I have to take the, the bad one, right? Okay, so this is a P position. Can we think, what about if it's just, uh, so what does that make this one here? Oops. So what's the right move? Remember how we always want to move to P positions if we can. So if this is our, our board, a two by two, what move should we make to leave the opponent with a P position? Don't we just want to take that bottom square right there? Of course. And in fact, what if it's two by three? So once again, taking this square, we can show that if we remove this square, then that little zigzag looking thing is a P position as well. And in fact, this generalizes to the uh, case of rectangles with two rows. We always want to take this one right here. And let's think about why that is. We have to show that for every kind of move, there's a winning response, okay? So let's say that the second player, so I'm the first player, I just took this thing right here. Let's say that the second player goes up here where can I go to restore it, to make it look like it was before? Can't I just take this one again? So what I'm saying is, when I when I said this is you this is if we remove this square right here, let me write it like this. If we remove this square, my claim is that this is a p position. P positions are losing positions. That's what we want to give our opponent. So whenever we have two rows, that poison thing is still up there, but we remove the bottom right corner. I claim that's always a P position. And the reason is we can always get back to another one that looks like this. So if somebody comes along and takes all these, for example, I can make this a P position again by taking this one. See, it's got that same kind of leftover. On the other hand, if they take one down here, they move like this, what, what move can I make to make it a P position again? Can you take all four at the top and the one adjacent or caddy corner to the X box? Like move from here? Yes. To the right and do down. Right. This one? It still leaves you at a P position. Uh, if we take this one, we, we're just going to have one square left right here. Right. Which I, so if, it, if somebody leaves me with that position, I can grab it and make them. So we don't, this is not a P position here. But let me just point out, if I take this one, um. right now it's got that same shape. It's got like the, the top row is just one longer than the bottom row. That's what I'm trying to illustrate with. And uh, if fear I'm not, maybe I'm not um, being super clear about it, but the position that we always want to get back to if there's two rows is one where the top row overhangs the bottom row by one square. And so we can show that if, if they move in the top row, if they move up here, we can always hand them back one of those losing positions by doing this. Now the top row overhangs by one square. Would that be the same for any amount of boxes that are factors of two or even numbers? Or does it only work with two? Um, it's, it, it only, that only works for two rows. Yeah. And in fact, if we look over here at three rows, all of a sudden it becomes hopelessly complicated. It's really very difficult to figure out what the right uh, how to how to play here. I, I I personally have no idea how to play on this one, <laughs> uh, unless and until somebody takes this one right here and gets rid of all those, 
And after that, after that move, now I'm back, yeah. we're back over here and I know exactly how to play. Um, okay, so does everybody, you feel like you understand how Trump has played? Like what the rules are at least? Maybe not the strategy, but the rules. Like, I don't know the strategy for the general game, but um, that's, that's the way it's played. So let's see why the first player always has a winning strategy. Okay, so like I mentioned before, either the first player has a winning strategy or the second player does. One of the two players does. So let's assume the second player does. Well, if that's true, like if we imagine the first player taking this square right here, Whatever move the second player might make, let's say it's this square right here, uh, put a smiley face there. Um, if that's the winning move for the second player, notice the first player could have made that move. So this is what's called strategy stealing. It, when you can make an argument that um, that that the first player can win by stealing the second player's strategy, that's strategy stealing. And that was what I was mentioning was developed. Was the first guy to come up to recognize that was John Nash. Um, and I will tell you that he did it in the context of a game called Hex, um, which was invented by Piet Hein. And it's actually a commercially available game. You can play it online. You can play it. I think they probably have like a board game version of it. Um, it's a beautiful game. This is another one where the first player can be shown to have a winning strategy. Uh, and this was John Nash's argument. So um, uh, Hex is, is, a, is a fun game as well. All right, any questions about Chomp? Okay, uh, in that case, let's go on. I thought I cleared all those, but okay. Uh, right, the first player could have made that move. Okay, so here's the game of Nim. Um, and uh, the way Nim is played is that you start with several pot. So it's kind of like the subtraction game in the sense subtraction game had a single pile of tokens. With Nim, you have several piles. Well, you might have one, but you could have many more than one too. Okay. They can have they can have any positive number of stones. So, um, uh, but we think of them as whole numbers. So, like seven or fifteen or whatever. And a move consists of choosing a pile and removing one or more tokens from that pile. So you have to remove something. You can't pass or whatever. And then the last player to remove, sorry, the player to remove the last token wins. And that's that's the normal play form. The first time I ever saw Nim was in a an avant-garde film. Have any of you seen Last Year at Marion Bad, the movie? I'm going to play a clip from there in just a minute, so you'll see uh, Nim being played in this in this movie. It's it's quite funny and dramatic. But um, okay, so here's an example of how we might play on uh, play a game of Nim. So. We start with four piles. The first pile has one stone, a token. Second pile has three tokens, five tokens, and seven tokens. The first player chose to take three from this pile that had five, so now that pile has two tokens. And then the second player chose to remove, so uh, I'll identify First player played there. Second player took all of those guys, which left just one, two, and seven. That's what we have here. The third, the, the uh, now it's back to the first player again. First player chose to remove four from here. And that leaves with, with one, two, three. The second player takes two from there. One, two, one. First player takes both of those. Uh-oh. Now our, our friend, the uh, second player, is in trouble because no matter what the second player does, 
in the next move, the first player will take the last token. Do you see? Okay. So in the, on this game, the first player wins because they took the last one. And let's, uh, let's play this clip real quick, if you don't mind. I think it's about 30 seconds or something, maybe less than a minute. I think what I'm going to do is, uh, I think I have it pulled up. I believe I do. I'm going to share a different screen if Zoom will let me. Can you see the YouTube screen? Okay, uh, I hope you'll be able to hear it as well. Can you hear? I don't think we can hear the audio. Uh, bummer, hold on, let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Um, let's see, so under share, uh under advanced sharing options yeah it's pa it's it's having some buffering difficulties anyhow here unfortunately um let me stop sharing for just a second and see if i can figure out uh try one more time No audio? It's not really, the audio isn't the most important part anyhow. Uh, just w watch the uh, play of the game. So here we have, here we have one, three, five, and seven matches that are put in a row. And so this guy over here on the right is, uh, is the master at NIM and he always wins no matter what. And people argue in this movie about, does the first player win, does the second player win? something like this, but uh, you'll see it's very dramatic with the way it's uh, they play the role. I apologize, I don't know what's going on with the buffering. For some reason, it's just not playing. Um, anyhow, the link is in the slides. Um, why don't we go back to uh, the other slide? This is unfortunately not uh, not doing what it's supposed to do for whatever reason. Um, okay, so uh, the, uh, Sophie, I don't know if you if it's you plan to make this. Well, the recording will be available. So if you're interested in seeing it, uh, you can also. It's okay with me if you want to make the uh, the slides available. This link is clickable. So in the slide, so you can always watch it. Let, let me try that. If I click it. Okay, yeah, it's not, it's not working. Um, never mind. Okay. Uh, so are you seeing you're seeing the regular slide now of my that I prepared? Okay, great. So the first player wins in this particular game. And as we'll see, uh, that's as it should be. Um, so let's let's I won't try to analyze them with you, um, except maybe we could recognize the following. Let's just notice what if we have um like two piles, both of which have three, right? So if I take two from here, what are you gonna do? Oops, I should have, I should uh, put a one. I took two, so I get one left over. What's a good move to make in that case? It's just like with chomp. Yeah, we want to have one there as well. That's right, Hal. Because now if it's my turn, I have to take one of these and then you take the other and you win, right? So whenever there's an equal number 
of stone, there's two piles with an equal number of stones, that's a that's going to be a losing position. That's a P position. So NN is a P position for what that's worth. Okay, so there's certain things that we could recognize pretty easily, but again, you get the sense that our goal here in trying to understand this game is to characterize the winning and losing positions, especially really we think of it as the losing positions are the ones that we're trying to understand. So this game, NIM, was uh, solved by Bhutan in 1901. And um, let's see what else I can tell you about that. These things. Question? Okay, so this game is universal. It's a, it's a universal game among all impartial games, which is to say that whenever you have one of the, it's a, I haven't told you what impartial means exactly, but it's like the games that we've been talking about. Those are all examples of impartial games. So for all of those games, they can be described in some sense as um, in terms of NIM. So NIM, NIM describes all these games in this way. There's a um, something called the Sprague-Grundy value of a game that's given in terms of, uh, of, of NIM. And so this is, this is uh, it's an amazing result actually. And so how do we, how do we, what's the strategy for winning at NIM? What we do is we express each number in each of the piles in binary form. And then that position is losing, it turns out, when there's an even number of ones in each place. So let's see the example that we played a moment ago. We had, th this was, we had one, three, five, and seven tokens in the piles. And here are the binary representations. Zero, zero, one is a binary representation of one. Zero, one, one for three. One, zero, one for five. And if you don't remember how that works, this is the ones place, the twos place, and the fours place. Like when we work in decimal, you would have the ones place, the tens place, and the hundreds place, right? Well, we're just, instead of taking powers of 10, in binary, we take powers of two. So this tells us, for example, one, we have one, a one in the one place and a one in the two place, one plus two makes three. One plus four makes five. One plus two plus four makes seven. Okay, so if you don't remember, you don't have to know how to com convert to binary, as long as you take my word for it, that that's what we have here is the binary representation of these numbers. And notice that in this first column, we have four of these uh, ones. In the second column, we have two ones. And in the third column, we have two ones. And so um, this meets the criterion to be a losing position. So that means that, sorry, I think I may have misspoken before. It's not the case that the first player should win. The second player should win. No matter what the first player does, mm -hmm. the second player can restore, can return a losing position back to the first player. And so, um, and you can think about that if you want, but like, uh, yeah, this, this an even number of ones in each column, you can think of it as it's like this position is somehow balanced and any move you make disturbs that balance. And so this, it's the job of the second player always to restore the balance after the first player moves. Um, okay, so that's the game of NIM. Any questions about that one? It's a fun, it's a really fun game. When my kids were small, we used to play this game like in restaurants when we were waiting for the meals, we would take the sugar packets and just make uh, piles that, uh, and they would, it's a good little numerical thing for them to try to figure out re logical reasoning kind of exercise for the young ones. You can play the subtraction game too. Okay, so um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit now about partitions because what I study are uh, combinatorial games on partitions. So what is a partition? A partition is just a way of writing some positive integer as the sum of other positive integers. So here are the partitions of five. There are seven of them. We can write five as a positive integer, four plus one, three plus two, three plus one plus one, two plus two plus one, those guys and these guys here. So there's seven partitions of five 
all told. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen or heard of a guy by the name of Ramanujan. He's a, a mathematician. He was uh, born in India, um, self-educated. I think maybe he graduated from high school. I'm not even certain about that. He was a clerk in India. And he wrote to a famous mathematician at the time by the name of Hardy, who is at Cambridge and Oxford, variously. And um, Hardy initially threw his letter away. He looked at it, read it, and said, oh, this is just a crank letter, because he got regular like crank communications from other people who think they were, thought they were proving something. So he threw it away and went to lunch. But while he was at lunch, the results that this guy, Ramanujan, had written down kept coming into Hardy's head. He's like, wait, let me think about that some more. So he went back after lunch and fished the letter out of the garbage can. And uh, later he commented that the results, though the, the Ramanujan didn't provide proofs of them, he said they were too beautiful not to be true. And uh, and so he um, eventually they began a correspondence and Hardy eventually brought Ramanujan over and they had a very productive uh, life, well, uh, uh, collaboration for a short time because Ramanujan didn't live very long. Um, unfortunately, he died young. Um, but Ramanujan and Hardy together did a lot of work on this question. So the number of partitions of N is denoted by P of N. So... So in particular, like here, we see that P of five is seven. And they uh, made a lot of progress. We, we don't have a, a, a closed form expression that tells you exactly what, like it's not N plus two or something like that, like five plus two is seven. It's not nothing, there's nothing so clean like that um, that tells us exactly how many partitions of a given number there are. So the best we can do really, well, we, we can estimate without precision, or we can simply brute force it and write them all down and count them. That's the best we have right now. So this is this is kind of an unusual situation in combinatorics. Um, well, I say it's unusual. It's not that unusual, but for something that has such a simple description, it's a little bit unusual. And so um, that's one of the reasons why they put so much effort into trying to understand how many partitions there are. Okay, so suffice it to say that um, partitions are important mathematical objects. They have connections to lots of different fields. And they, um, and so here's, here's a graphical way of representing them. These are called Young diagrams. So this for five here, that means, so this the first sum n tells you how many go in the first row. So this only has one row, so we're gonna put five squares in the first row. Four plus one looks like so. So we're going to put four squares in the first row and one in the second row. Three plus two looks like this one. Three plus one plus one is that one. Two plus two plus one, that one, and that one. So I don't know if it's clear. It's not really all that essential, but I think it's kind of nice for you to see this very natural way of representing um, partitions in a, in a graphical way. It's these young diagrams that we actually play the games on. So let's see how that goes. Uh, I've been working primarily with these two guys, Matyash Kurtz and Peter Mersic. Now, both of them are Slovenian. They're uh, professors at the University of Primorska in Koper, Slovenia. I don't know if you guys like to travel, but let me recommend Koper. It's a beautiful, beautiful town. Mm. It's right on the Adriatic. It's a medieval town. So they have these beautiful old stone buildings, right, like a tower, a stone tower that rises at maybe five four floors or so. Really pretty uh, place. Good food, nice people. And it's affordable too. So anyhow, there that's where they are. Um, I was on sabbatical at the University of Primorska in 2018. And this young woman, Yelena Illich, she was one of my students, and she asked me if I would supervise her senior project, which was, I felt very honored by that invitation. Uh, so I accepted, but I was back in the States at that time. So Matyash and I uh, co-supervised her senior project. The, the, the regulations required that one person uh, be an actual member of the faculty at Pumorska. So that was Matyash. Um, and subsequently, um, Peter and I, so uh, she she graduated, she did a nice paper, 
So Matyash, Peter, and I then generalized. We, we, we wrote it. So, well, Matyash, Yelena, and I wrote a paper together that was published. And then Matyash, Peter, and I uh, got further results on that same game, which has, was also recently published. And uh, later, Matyash asked me if I would also supervise the senior project of Ina, which I did. She defended this past summer. It was really fun for me. I was back there and I got to see her graduate so, or, or give her presentation, her defense. That was really nice. And currently the three of us are working on an article as well. So we've got two articles that we're working on right now, um, both in combinatorial game theory on partitions. So let's see what these games might be. Um, so th there's a lot, first of all, there's lots of different ones. One of the games, the one that we did with Yelena is called LCTR. That means left column, top row. That's what it stands for. So um, each player in turn can either remove the left column or the top row of the partition. And again, the goal is to uh, take the last square. So we completely solved this game. Now, uh, Yelena did not completely solve it in her thesis, but she did solve it in special cases. Peter and Matyash and I solved it together. And so um, that was, uh, I was very happy about that. Another game is called CR. That's the one that I'm working on with Ina and Matyash right now. There we generalize it. The idea is that you can remove any column or any row. And if you remove a column, say, then uh, like basically you rejoin. So notice you get what looks like two partitions. One of them is over here. Hard to draw with a mouse. And another is over here. But what we do is we stick those two back together. We rejoin them. Like, so we, we remove the column and then stick them back together. Same with the row. If you remove the row, you stick them back together. And uh, I had a student at Rhodes by the name of Zach Roeder who wrote a really nice senior project on what happens if you don't stick them back together, if you leave them split, and then you, in subsequent play, you have to pick one of the partitions and make a move there. You take either a row or a column. So uh, we have not completely solved this game, but we've made some good progress. We have some interesting conjectures. Um, so I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm feeling optimistic about uh, this as a game as well. And then the one that we're working on with Peter, uh, let me clear these, is called impartial chess. So um, like for example, uh, one of the games you could play would be King. And uh, this, this is a game that was proposed, these games, it's actually a, a class, um, a set of games. It's several different games. It was proposed by Elwin Burlakamp, who was a famous combinatorial game theorist. He he was at Berkeley, but he's no longer with us. He passed away, unfortunately. But in the game of King, you can move here or here or here. And so you always continue in this downward and to the right direction. Like, a usual king in chess, if you play chess, you know, we could also move back that way, but that's not allowed here. You can only move down and to the right. Okay. So that's the game of king. And again, the when when the king gets into one of these corners, that's going to be a losing position. That's what's called a terminal position for the game. And then the opponent loses. And for each of these games, for king, rook, with rook, that's an interesting one as well. If we have rook instead, so rook, you may recall, uh, you can go here, you can go there, you can go there, etc., or you can go down like this if you know how rooks move in chess. And um, and then from these positions, you know, you can do the same thing. You can go there or there or there. And so on. I mean, I'm only drawing three, but you can go to any of these in the same row or in the same column. So that's what a rook move looks like. Oops.
Um, so uh, in this case, it's really easy. The first player should just go there. And then the second player doesn't have a move, right? Um, OK, so uh, this is another a bunch of games. And one of the exciting things that we did here, um, there's a professor at Rutgers by the name of um, uh, I'm going to go and block Gervich, Vladimir Gervich. He um, he has this classification scheme for games, and we showed that LCTR belongs to a certain region of this classification that he didn't know if there were any games that existed there. So this was exciting. In a sense, we uh, we showed that in that particular region of his classification scheme, there are games, and LCTR is one of them. Okay, I, I think I'm just about out of time here. I don't want to. I want to be mindful of your time, so I'm going to stop. And we still have a few minutes for questions, if there are any. I have a question about impartial chess. Yeah. Um, so you showed us a king move. You showed us a rook move. When you're playing the actual game, are all pieces of the chess board available to use mm -hmm. at one time? Only one. Only one piece, correct? Or one. Right. We less we uh, the way we the, the way we have the way Burlakamp defined impartial chess, and we followed his approach, is to imagine these different different uh, chess pieces, like you have one chess piece that's on the board, that chess piece moves in a particular way. For Berlekamp, he conceived of it not on uh, an arbitrary partition. So that was, our, that was our contribution or one of our contributions. He conceived of it as being played on a rectangular grid, like a chess board. And so we took his uh, games and generalized them to play on an arbitrary partition. And uh, so the partitions were very natural in this context. And um, so, yeah, but it's just, it's the same game always, uh, sorry, the same piece. So, and and the moves of that piece are available to both players. I see. Good question. What else? How? Um, this is, uh, we'll admit, this is way beyond me. Um, Shelly and, and Sophie <laughs> um, are following it, I'm sure, much better than me. But just curious, what are... are the titles of a couple of the courses that that you teach at Rhodes, I I just would be interested in hearing how, you know, how complex the subject matter might be. Sure. Um. So some courses I teach at Rhodes this semester. I'm teaching multivariable calculus. I'm teaching linear algebra, and I'm teaching combinatorics. Gotcha. Um. So combinatorics is my area of training, and this. As you may guess from the title of the talk, combinatorial games, it fits in that in that uh, world. So this, is, this combinatorial game theory is a part of combinatorics. Very and, impressive. Very impressive. Um, <laughs> and there, last semester, I taught differential equations, and I also taught uh, a computer science course, which is called Discrete Structures. And I taught multivariable calculus again. Um, for next semester, I'm actually in the process of developing a course right now that's going to be called um, uh, Voting, Power, and Fairness. So this is this is a more applied kind of thing. Um, I, I do have one publication in voting theory, and so it's I'm kind of excited to teach this class for the first time. I have some students who are doing a reading course with me right now on it. Like they're reading it on their own. Um, but so, you know, when we vote, we use this thing called a plurality method where uh, like whoever gets the most votes, the most votes wins. If the field is crowded, that doesn't have to be a lot of votes. Like, for example, in the last mayoral race, if you remember, there were a whole bunch of candidates and um, it was thought that Harrington had a pretty good chance of winning, for example, because he had good name recognition. He had been mayor for 18 years previously. And with some, you know, he had a, a base of support. Um, it didn't work out that way. But when you have a large number, a, a large field of candidates, the plurality method um, sometimes will elect someone who maybe like only a third of the people really like or something like that. Um, but there are other ways of voting as well. And you and for the council seats, they have these runoffs, which uh, we don't have for mayors. So uh, plurality with a runoff, if nobody gets a majority, that's another option. Um, what do you think about the ranking 
uh, voting structure. The, Are you right. With, so yeah. I have a couple of thoughts about that. One of them is, um, first of all, no voting method is perfect. So there are valid criticisms of it. Second of all, it's vastly superior to the plurality method for, uh, and not just, it's also superior to the current runoff system. And the reason it's, the reasons it's superior, it has, it has better theoretical properties for one thing. Uh, but in addition, it saves the voters the expense or the taxpayers the expense of actually conducting a runoff election. That can be quite mm -hmm. expensive. So, um, and, and finally, mm -hmm. a, a final thought that I have is that the voters approved it twice and I'm super unhappy with the council. I mean, this is just a, per a personal opinion and forgive me for getting personal about it, but it's super frustrating to me when the voters give clear signals like that, not once, but twice that they want it. And the council's like, eh, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, they don't, no politician wants to change the method of voting that got them elected. So- Of course not. Um, yeah. Are all your courses other than the one you're going to start next semester. Are those all graduate level courses? No, no, no. Rhodes okay. doesn't have any graduate programs. These are all oh, okay. graduate courses. Oh, okay. It's not entirely true that we don't have any graduate programs. We have a master's degree in accounting yeah. um, that we've had for a number of years now, like maybe 30 years or something like that. Um, but that's, and for a short time, we had a master's in urban education, but uh, that was a short lived program. And uh, and now, except for the master's in accounting, it's all undergraduate. Thank you. Well, if I had you as a professor, I might have taken more math classes. In <laughs> Thank you. That's kind. My <laughs> my last math class was, I think, my junior year of high school. So this is this is, puts a whole new spin on it. Um, and I'm so grateful that you came back for your second lecture. We're so grateful for everything you offered us, and um, it definitely changes the way I think about the, these these subjects and it. But it makes it fun. I mean, I think that's really what it comes down to. So thank you for your time and your your uh, your lecture today. Thank you so much. Yeah, fun is why I got into this. I mean, I love uh, math is fun for me, but this particular topic, combinatorial game theory, it's one that undergraduates really seem to enjoy. I've supervised several senior projects on this topic. And um, it's it's like I said, it's a, I, I have to pinch myself every day. It's so much fun. I, I love working with these kids. Oh, that's awesome. And I've enjoyed talking to you guys too. So thank you. Rhodes is lucky to have you and we're lucky to have you. So thank you, Dr. Thank Gottlieb. You. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Happy early birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. And I hope everyone has a good rest of your day and an early Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. And uh, can I just say Hillel is lucky to have you, Sophie. Can we give a round of applause to Sophie for organizing this? Thank you. Thank you so much. This is one of the highlights for sure. Okay, guys. Bye-bye. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.